Okay, so hi everyone, um, it's Kieran. Uh, okay, so we're gonna go over chronic kidney disease. So we went over um, acute kidney injury in the last or last week, I think. Um, so what happens in chronic kidney disease is when you have this like prolonged, like significant um, renal decrease in renal function. So when we talk about renal function, we always we, we're talking about our nephron function, we're talking about our glomerular, our, our glomerular filtration rate. Um, so with acute kidney injury, that's like that sudden, you know, decrease in renal fu function. But when we talk about chronic kidney disease, that's when it, this is prolonged and it happens over a long period of time and it becomes irreversible. That's when you get into the dialysis part and when you get into um, kidney transplants, which we're going to go over later. Um, so the main causes of this chronic kidney disease is usually, again, that acute renal failure, um, hypertension, uh, because hypertension, what happens is, we, like we know, that causes pressure on the arteries. And because we have pressure on the arteries and it's causing um, on the artery walls, the kidney becomes damaged and there's less blood getting to the nephrons, which means that there's decrease in glomerular filtration rate. Um, diabetes, um, like I talked about in the last, um, in acute renal failure, I talked about those little cells, um, the mesangial uh, cells. So there's specific, like there's five or four things that happen to those mesangial cells in diabetes. So one of them is mesangial expansion, which we'll learn about later. And that causes those damage because those mesangial cells are helping with the renin release and helping with detecting, um, you know, glomer, uh, function of glomer, uh, the nephron function and helping with that. So diabetes affects those as well as the glucose that damages our vessels uh, that are supplying your kidneys. And again, kidney damage, uh, renal failure. So... Uh, from last year, from uh, I, I, the professor really told us to know about the stages of chronic kidney disease and focusing more on the four and five, but knowing um, the glomerular filtration uh, for these stages is kind of important, just like being familiar with them um, and just knowing the significance in each. Uh, so in kidney uh, so in kidney damage, the first stage, you'll see that the glomerular filtration is normal or it's increased. So it, it's, it, it'll be at a normal rate. Uh, but here you'll see like protein uh, urea. So protein urea is when you have protein in your urine. You're not supposed to have protein in your urine. Your, um, your nephron, that, that glomerular filter, uh, the, that glomerulus um, doesn't take protein it, it and it doesn't have and it doesn't take blood either it's mainly filtering your water your electrolytes all of these things so you don't want to see protein or blood in your urine uh, so in stage one you may see protein um, and in kidney in the second stage you may also see protein in your urine um, so moving on to like four and five, which we're going to be focusing on more, um, again, you'll see these like increase in creatinine levels, which we talked about last time, um, increase in creatinine levels, as well as increase in, uh, uh uremia as, uh, as well. So, so one thing that happens is that because we have this like, we have these nephrons because we have so many right we have my nephron is like a functional unit right so when you have this decrease in blood flow that is going to your kidneys um decrease in blood flow and your nef one nephron kind of dysfunctions and it reduces function it causes your it causes um your blood to flow to another um uh made it sorry your your blood flow goes to the other nephrons right to find okay let's see if this one's working that one's working but then it kind of goes into that vicious cycle right you uh, decrease in functioning of those nephrons the problem is that nephron and the glomerulus filtration rate and it's due to those second those primary effects such as hypertension and diabetes so this results in glomerular hyperfiltration Okay. So because you have this urine output that is decreased in your body, it's kind of 
causes your body to hold on to this waste product because again our body is it, our kidneys are the ones that are excreting this waste but we're holding on to this so some of the clinical manifestations from here that you can see are uremia and again uremia is that elevation in that creatinine the elevation in the blood um, urine and nitrogen levels so uh, what you'll see here is you'll see like these because you have this increase in waste product and that build up you'll see that there's going to be some uh, neurological changes that you're going to see um, which the main one is like peripheral neuropathy which is it affects your sensory and motor function, especially what happens as it decreases your pain sensation. So you're going to see a lot of this in like diet people who have diabetes, um, who have like severe prolonged diabetes. Um, that's why, like, and on another note, uh, when you are looking at foot care, especially those people who have diabetes, they may not be able because they have near peripheral neuropathy or diabetic neuropathy. The, you'll find that they don't, they can't feel like if they have a lesion on their foot so you always want to do foot care and make sure that uh, may, uh, that's why they're more at risk of having um, ulcers or whatever because they can't feel that pain um, that's an, another thing but anyways uh, so you also find that they'll have demyelination of those nerve fibers so remember that de that myelin sheath on your nerve fibers helps with the transmission of of um, uh, transmission uh, from uh, transmission of uh, nerve connections, right? So that if that demyelination is slow, that demyelination kind of slows down that um, uh, nerve connections. So you'll also see the restless leg syndrome, which you'll have that like tingling of the feet, you'll tingling sensation. You may also see that they're unsteady uh, with their gait and and. Asterix is basically when you have your hands and they move, make like a bird flapping motion, like uh, up and down, just extending their wrist. So you'll find that as well, as well as hand, hand tremors. So um, uh, one thing to note here again is uh, because of this elevated bun, you'll, you'll see and psilopathy, which is that um, disorientation, um, loss of consciousness type of um, symptoms so with um this increase in bun what happens is because you have uh, this in increase in bun you'll find that they'll have these uremic crystals that form on their skin it kind of looks like dry dry skin but it's, it, it kind of looks like a uh, sparkles like like a uh, salt on skin type of thing and you'll find that they have itchy skin because those uremic crystals are being kind of uh this waste product is building up and being excreted through your sweat glands and kind of sitting on the skin uh so and because of this all of this um you know these crystals and this itchiness and um, this waste product buildup, you'll find that they'll have um, the immune function in terms of their immune function, it'll, they'll be more likely to have infection. Um, and again, their skin may be pale, there may be um, dry, yellow. Um, and the reason they will be pale and bruising is because of anemia, which is another clinical manifestation. Because remember, our kidneys, um, you know, have uh, produced erythropoietin, which helps create these red blood cells in your bone marrow, right? They help form these red blood cells. And because if our kidney function is decreasing, that means our erythropoietin is also decreasing. That means we're not making many red blood cells and therefore we're not, that oxygen carrying capacity is decreasing. Therefore we may have anemia. As well, like I talked about, um, proteinemia, which we'll see uh, that protein in your urine because we're we're uh, because your body it your um, sorry your uh, 
glomerulus or your nephron is starting to exc excrete albumin into the urine. And remember that albumin we talked, uh, you guys probably must have learned about how albumin actually relegate, regulates oncotic pressure. And oncotic pressure prevents fluid from going to the interstitial space. So if we don't have this albumin, that means that it's going to cause swelling. So you'll see swelling in these patients. Um, you, you'll see swelling in these patients. You'll see hypertension because they're holding on to this water and salt. Okay. Um, yeah, and then hematuria, which is that of blood in the urine. Um, so again, we're not supposed to see blood in the urine. We're not supposed to see protein in the urine. Uh, blood, and because we're losing that blood, and that's why they will also have that anemia, that pale looking, and that um, bruising exterior. So fluid and electrolytes, um, water again, and sodium, because we're unable to, inability for us to to concentrate our urine, what we're doing is we're holding on to a lot of sodium. And remember that's water, the water wants to go wherever sodium wants to go. So if we're holding on to a lot of sodium, we're going to be holding on to a lot of water. And this is going to increase our um, increase um, our fluid levels, it's going to increase um, our blood pressure as well. Okay, so uh, the way the nursing management these Collaborative, collaborative care and this would be giving diuretics. However, diuretics will only have the will only work from stage one to three when, and then from four to five is more of that um, end stage and severe uh, renal failure. So you'll find that um, you'll find that um, uh, dialysis um, and yeah, dialysis as well as will be more functional. Okay. So again, due to this decrease in glomerular filtration, that's why we have this sodium and water retention. Again, you'll see that peripheral edema like I talked about, which is because of that albumin, which is being screened and we, we don't have as much albumin to regulate that oncotic pressure. Another thing you'll see is um, an increase in potassium. And you'll see this more in patients who are in stage five. Um, so because of this, again, decrease in glomerular filtration, what's happening is you're um, retaining more potassium because our distal tubule that has that sodium and potassium pump is no longer functioning. So we're holding on to a lot of potassium. And what happens is, Remember, we see ECG changes whenever we are looking at potassium hyperkalemia, right? We see um, that peaked T wave, so we want to pay attention to any cardiac issues that can happen with uh, patients who have um, chronic kidney disease because we'll see this hyperkalemia. So they may be at risk of VTAC or uh, VFIP. So one thing I just wanted to go back. Okay. So another thing that you'll see here is metabolic acidosis. So the reason is because our our um our whole like our renal system, right, our nephron is also in charge of you know regulating and are regulating our bicarb as well as our uh, hydrogen, right? So when we don't excrete this hydrogen, we are increasing um, this uh, acidosis and uh, uh, this acidosis. So you'll see metabolic acidosis. You'll see those symptoms of cosmal breathing and um, uh, cosmal breathing and other respiratory changes because they want to, um, they want, their body wants to regulate and get rid of that acid. Um, another one that you'll see with because of this metabolic acidosis is that bone decalcification. And that's more because of the hypokalemia, which we'll go through. So, um, sorry, hypocalcemia. Hypocalcemia, the reason we have hypocalcemia is because remember our kidneys are the ones that activate the vitamin D. And they activate vitamin D in order to reabsorb calcium from the food. But if we have chronic kidney disease and our, our 
kidneys aren't functioning properly, we're going to find that we're not uh, act, we're not producing as much vitamin D to activate this reabsorption calcium. So that's where we'll see hypocalcemia. In addition, again, you'll see that non mill production of calcitrol, which is that decreased calcium reabsorption. Right, so what's going to happen is um, you have this decrease in calcitrol again, this hypokalemia then stimulates our parathyroid gland and the parathyroid gland um, starts to what happens is because it's it's seeing that oh cal uh, calcium is low i'm going to try to you know put in more calcium it starts to take out calcium from the bones and that's what makes our bones more brittle and causes that osteodystrophy which you'll see in patients with chronic kidney disease um, so you'll see these skeletal disorders you'll see more increase in bone fracture risk as well um, so with high you'll see high bone turnover which is uh which is means that it's bone remodeling this means that um you have your osteoblasts and you have your osteo osteoblasts which are making you know bone and that is that is um uh, decreasing that bone density because we have this, you know, calcium that's getting out of the bones. You'll see that there's high bone turnover. Your bones are decreasing in density as well as uh, low bone turnover, which is that increase in amount of osteocytes. So, yeah. Okay. So does anyone have questions so far? Any questions? No, you're good. Okay. Okay. Awesome. Um, so one thing to remember with calcium is that whenever you see a decrease in calcium, you're going to see an increase in phos uh, phosphate. So you're going to see hyperphosphatemia in patients who have chronic kidney disease. So again, because of this glomerular filtration, we're not able to excrete this potassium. The reason is because you have this decrease in phosphate, right? Your calcium is start binds to your phosphate. And that's also why you'll have this decrease in calcium because all of that calcium is binding to the, inc the increased phosphate. So, and that's what leads to this osteodystrophy. Okay. So, in you'll also find, um, sorry, I'm just looking through my notes. Okay. Okay, so you also find hypermagnesia, um, magnesium, yeah. Um, so you'll find that the symptoms are weakness, hypotension, because again, magnesium actually, you know, it uh, it regulates. Mag magnesium is a vasodilator, right? So it regulates that hypertension, the uh, vascular wall. So it can cause hy uh, hypotension. Um, and it's and they and you can see this in patients who have diabetes again. Um, same thing. So, um, sorry, this is actually supposed to be down here because that's talking about anemia. Um, okay, so okay, uh, so let's talk about um, anemia. Um, with anemia, again, you're going to see, again, like I said, because we have this decrease in erythropoietin because of the kidney function is decreased, um, you'll find the red blood cell production is also impaired. So what happens is um, you'll have oxygen saturation, which is low, the patient will feel lethargic. Again, you'll see pallor, shortness of breath, all of those types of symptoms. So this anemia affects your cardiac system as well because again you'll find tachycardia with them again decrease in oxygen supply um, and low tissue perfusion because you're you don't have as many blood cells to carry oxygen to your um, tissues um, Do you guys have any questions so far?
Yep, just volume. Good. Awesome. Okay, so um, cardiac, one thing you'll see um, is hypertension again because we have this increase in fluid volume, right? Retaining so much fluid that we can see hyper. Um, uh, volemia as well. Um, so you'll see that due to this fluid accumulation, you have this increase in uh, peripheral vascular resistance, um, decrease in flu in blood flow to the kidneys because it activates that RAS system. Because what's happening is that your kidneys think that because we're re we there's decrease, you know, uh, water that's being filtered. They think that oh, our blood our blood pressure is low. So it tries to increase our blood pressure even more, but it's not really helping because we're retaining all of this water anyways, which is um, causing hypertension. So you also find heart, um, uh, heart disease, again, heart failure because of this, uh, as well as pul pulmonary edema. And that's why we wanna make sure that we're assessing the lungs with these patients because they're retaining so much uh, fluid, the fluid may go into the lungs. Um, again, uh, pericarditis, like I talked about um, in when we talked about uh, manifestations such as um, such as uh, infection. Um, one of the things that you may find is pericarditis because of this elevated uremic level, which causes that infection rate. Um, and GI, you'll find that they may be there may be um, anorexic, not uh, nausea as well as vomiting. Um, you'll find that um, there may be bleeding in the GI tract as well as um, this is this is related to the anemia as well as um, uremia. So I actually put down the lab values that you guys need to know for this because of calcium, magnesium, and phosphate. So again, again, understanding that um, calcium and phosphate have an inverse relationship. So if you see an increase in phosphate, you'll see a decrease in calcium, a decrease in phosphate, increase in calcium. So to increase, to decrease our phosphate, we we need to increase our calcium, so that's why we will give um, cal uh, vitamin D supplements, but calcium supplements. Um, yeah, and we'll f we'll give uh, calcium calcium bind uh, I think phosphate bind yeah phosphate binding drugs, so that instead of calcium, we'll have uh, we ha will have something to bind to the phosphate. Okay. So let's go to dialysis. Okay, so how it, so dialysis is basically um, it kind of makes a it's a filter. It's making it's helping filter blood just like your kidneys would. It's it's a temporary. Uh, it's a it's a fake kidney. So a dialyzer is um, forms like a semi permeable membrane, just like um, just like you would have uh, have in your tubules that wall um, that uh, filters the different ions, right? It would be similar to that. So a, dial a dialyzer acts like kidney. Um, and it's this this tube that you'll find, so right here, so there's different types, right? You have your hemodialysis and then you have your peritoneal. Main thing to focus on with these is with peritoneal dialysis, it is inside of the cavity, it's inside of the peritoneum, while hemodialysis is um, hemodia uh, hemodialysis is outside of the body. The filtering occurs outside of the body. Um, okay. So um, the way that this works is, again, the dialysate is actually a fluid that creates this concentration gradient, just like it would in your nephron. Okay. 
Okay. Um, however, there's some complications that can occur with these two, especially such as hypotension. Because we're, we're taking fluid out, they can be at risk of hypotension, um, nausea, vomiting, these muscle cramps as well. Um, so that's one of the complications that can occur with that. Um, and one of the things to note um, is uh, if uh, we usually prime the line with heparin because there may be a risk of clotting. Okay, um, all right. So there's peritoneal dialysis and there's hemodialysis, which is one of the uh, two most important that you guys need to kind of pay attention to. Um, so with uh, peritoneal dialysis, it's um, there's a catheter that's actually placed in the abdomen or the peritoneal space, and it acts as the dialyzer. Remember, the dialyzer acts like an artificial kidney. Um, and what happens is that we this um, hopefully you guys can see this picture um, dialysis solution, right? And you have a drain. You have a so you have something that collects all of the uh, fluid that is being taken out, the waste product. So what happens is we inject a very, um, we inject um, with a very high, or, or we inject it with dextrose, which is a hyper, um, it, it's a, it's high in dextrose. So what happens is you're you're attracting water. You're attracting all of these salt. This um this you're attracting all of these solutes to the solution because um because again where water goes anywhere you're you know you have a higher concentration gradient. It's going through this osmosis phase. Um, so we're collecting this waste product through that. Um, so usually this takes like 20 to 30 minutes and you, it's a chronic management system. Um, the reason we use the peritoneal cavity is because it's rich in capillaries, right? So you're having access to this um, larger amount of blood supply um, when we have that. So again, you have this you have this drain and you have the dialysis solution, which is that um, high um, high dextrose solution um, that is attracting these uh, this water through osmosis. Okay. Okay. And one thing that can so this can happen so this can be done at home or the clinic. Um, one of the complications to note, I would say that this is um, the complications are kind of important just to just to differentiate the compl complications between peritoneal and hemodialysis. Um, so the complications for peritoneal is peritonitis because again we are putting something foreign into um, a cavity and that may um, increase. Uh, risk of infection. Um, elevated hyperglucose because, uh, sorry, elevated glucose levels, it's because we're putting this, you know, um, high dextrose solute which into the cavity, um, as well as dehydration like we talked about. We're taking fluid out, which is, um, which can cause hypotension and, yeah, hypotension um, and decreased volume. Uh, well, hemodialysis um, happens outside of the body. So that dialyze, uh, that dialyzer, um, so you have this artificial, right? You have this artificial kidney, which is that dialyzer right there. So it uh, is kind of cleansing the blood outside of the body. And it's, um, and what happens here is that you have, uh, it is through one compartment. So it doesn't have the, um, it doesn't have uh, one, um, it doesn't have two things that collect, one collects waste, one collects thing. Um, it is it is kind of filtering it outside the kidney, uh, outside of the kidney. So it's usually well, what they what they do is they put it through either your jugular subclavian um, uh, um, subclavian artery to um, uh, for this treatment, and it's usually a long term treatment. 
Um, so it can through a fistula. Use it can either be through a fistula, and the fistula is basically just like an opening that they make um, in your uh, in a large artery or vein in your arm. Um, the reason they do this is because there's less infection, risk of infection, and thrombosis. Um, so like it's a, it looks in this picture, similar to this picture. And does that make sense so far? Okay, good. Um, let me know if you guys have any questions or if I'm like, doesn't, if I'm going too fast or like I'm missing things. Um, okay, so, uh, and one thing to note here is like complications because again, just like you guys learned in practice, whenever you're putting in a catheter, one of the main things to focus on is like air embolus or hemorrhage that can happen as well as sepsis with most of these things because we're putting in a foreign object into the body so there's going to be a risk of uh, a risk of infection mm -hmm. so for kidney transplant um they didn't look last year they didn't ask us much about this um, it was just interesting to know. It's just uh, knowing that the patients who have transplants, so they're so they're going to be made, they're going to be put in put on immunosuppressive um, therapy um, because there may be a risk of rejection. Um, so uh, rejection is usually asymptomatic, which is kind of scary. But um, yeah, and it's. Um, just knowing, just knowing that uh, it usually per so how it presents, how you know that they are going through rejection is usually because you know you have this increase in creatinine, and you're going to have the symptoms that you may have um, uh, that uh, that you may have through that from from acute kidney and chronic kidney. So actually, I forgot to do this part of the. Um, hypocalcemia so with hypocalcemia the, these are important symptoms to know the um chest aches sign and trousseau's sign so with the chest aches you'll see basically what happens is when you tap on the facial nerve you guys probably know where the facial nerve is from assessment um if you tap on the facial nerve you'll see that the patient kind of like twitches their cheek towards where you're tapping um while trousseau sign is carpal you you guys probably know what carpal tunnel is right from like video games people play video games and their kind of hands kind of curve in towards their body right that's that's basically what is that carpal uh, spasm that happens when you put for example if i I'll put in a BP cuff and I inflate it, um, the, the hand moves towards the body and it kind of curves in, just like this picture. Um, yeah. I'm just trying to check if I missed anything. Do you guys have any questions so far or anything that you're kind of uh, confused about for chronic kidney that you want me to go over again? Can you please go back to the values? Yeah. Let me just go down. These are the values. Um, yeah, so those are the main values that you guys need to know. Again, just knowing that calcium will be low, magnesium will be high. Basically, everything will be high except your calcium. Um, yeah, and just knowing that they are the inverse relationship of calcium and phosphate. Yeah, I just thought it would be easier just to have that there. Um, do you need to memorize these values? Uh, yes, <laughs> I think it would be better to memorize it. Um, just because, yeah, I'm pretty sure they did ask one time like about it. So just knowing, yeah. 
for the test. But like for in the clinical setting, all the time they have it like on the chart, like they have the values on the chart, um, which is great. Um, but yeah, just being familiar with the values is good. Um, so these medications I went over last week and I went over actually a lot about chronic on um, in the last week. I don't know if you guys noticed, but like some of the things I kind of already talked about, but I'm going to go over the medications again, um, uh, if that's okay. Um, so for, again, like we talked about vitamin D, our kidneys are the ones that activate vitamin D, right? And, and this, there's a reduction in calcitrol because of, um, because of the kidney decrease in kidney function. So this actually promotes this absorption of calcium. Um, so we want to give this to them so that it corrects that calcium. And remember when we correct that calcium, it will help with our phosphate levels as well. Um, hemopyotics, remember we talked about um, erythropoiesis or erythropoietin, um, which is, a, it, which is um, in the kidneys and actually helps it helps create those red blood cells in the bone marrow. So um, having uh, administering um, hematopoietics will help with anemia associated with the renal failure or chronic kidney disease. Um, loop diuretics again will help from stage one to three, but four and five you'll most likely be on dialysis. Um, so furosemide would be one. Um, again, we don't want to give any potassium sparing diuretics because we're already high on potassium. Um, so loop diuretics would be our best um, guess. Um, phosphate binding, again, we talked about how the reason why our calcium is low, another reason is because we have all of this phosphate that's increased in calcium bonds binds to this phosphate. So because we have such high levels of phosphate, our calcium is binding to that. And that's what's reducing our calcium levels in the blood. So um, by giving phosphate binding, it binds to that dietary phosphate, right, to form calcium phosphate and improve that hy uh, hyperphosphatemia that occurs. Um, uh, so k exalate is this one. k exalate is going to help with the potassium levels in our blood. So it's going to remove that potassium and uh, from from that yeah, so it's going to remove that potassium to lower that to lower potassium levels. Um, so those are the main things to know about these uh, medications, I would say. Um, trying to figure out what else there is. I, I go through it really fast and I think that I'm missing something, but I don't think I am. Um, and in terms of like nutritional, actually, I didn't go with that, I think. Yeah, there it is. Okay. The dietary management. Okay, I knew I was. Missing. So um, again, when people are in dialysis and when we're looking at diet management, we want to look at their protein as well as their fluid electrolytes. Patients who are on, not on dialysis, they restrict their protein to decrease worsening of the GFR because again, we um, we don't want to increase that. Uh, that protein for those patients. Um, with hemodialysis, higher protein intake is okay um, because because we have increase in kidney function. We have like a temporary increase in kidney function. Um, and fluid and electrolytes, again, we want to restrict sodium and fluid because already they have, um, they're retaining sodium, they're retaining water, so we want to restrict that. Potassium restrictions as well, foods that contain potassium, we want to decrease that, as well as decreasing phosphorus foods as well. Um, Okay, I like this picture. Look, I like this picture because it kind of um, summarizes what peritoneal dialysis is and hemodialysis is, which I like. Um, okay, and hopefully I explained those a 
well um so continuous renal replacement therapy is um it kind of so it provides that uh, filtering of that uh fluid as well as you know clearing out those urinary toxins over 8 to 24 hours so that can be that's because there's no rapid shifts so because of the rapid shifts in fluid and electrolytes that don't occur with this um, therapy, um, it's better tolerated in critically ill patients. So you'll see this in more uh, patients who are chronically ill. Um, but the one main things to focus on, I would say, were hemo and hemodialysis and peritoneal dialysis and just knowing the difference between them and the complications that can happen between them. Um, is there any questions you guys may have? How are you guys feeling for this exam? Can you please go back to the drugs? Yep, sure. Do you want me to talk about more of the drugs or do you want me to just be, like, put it here so you guys can see it? So, yeah, so just knowing what vitamin, why we're giving vitamin D because, again, our kidneys are the ones that are um, helping with activating that vitamin D and helping with calcium uh, calcium absorption. But that's why by giving vitamin D is going to help increase calcium and therefore decrease phosphate. Um, again, hemopyotics, erythropoiesis, our kidneys are the ones that are doing all of the um, act and that are producing the red blood cells um, in our um, bone marrow, which is activating that you know, and so because they have that erythropoietin, so uh, that's going to correct our anemia, that's going to correct our paleness, the bruising, um, uh, that's going to correct a lot of things, especially our cardiac um, issues that we may have due to anemia. Um, yeah, and then diuretics as well, which I said that from stage one to three are the most effective, but after that, dialysis is needed. Um, How are you guys feeling so far about this? It's kind of like the, it's kind of like just a one branch off of the kidney, of the acute kidney injury. So it's not too bad, just some of the things like calcium and stuff. Um, it's good to know. Okay, that's good. Um, how's everyone else? Uh, Darla says that she's feeling good. Um, I have a question. So when kidney failure, the kidney accumulates the waste produced and it decreases. This concentration decreases. Yeah. So we so with kidney failure, yes, it accumulates the waste and it um, so it accumulates waste and so it's because of that decrease in excretion. So because it's not getting rid of any um uh waste your 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 take like your yeah, that waste is building up um so that's why your that's why you'll see concentrated urine because you're not seeing much water in the urine Do, does that make sense you're not seeing much water in the urine so because you are retaining all of that water again water likes all of the like sodium so it's going to stay in your body does that make sense? But how the creatinine level is high? Yeah, yeah. Because um, I don't know exactly. Lauren, are you here? Um. So yeah, our creatinine levels are going to be high. Um. This is because that because again. So wait a second. I just have to go back to my notes because I wrote this down. Um, Yeah, so our creatinine levels is going to be high because um, 
because of that because of how our glomerular OS can't filter properly. That's why we are um, retaining, we are increasing creatinine. Does that make sense? That mm -hmm. breakdown is that, is that why? Creatinine level is in the urine. In the urine, in the urine. Right? Yeah. Yeah, uh, you have your hand up. Oh yes, that, uh, Kiran. Thank you so much. I think uh, just to simplify, creatinine level is reflected on the blood level. So uh, the urine actually deals with the osmolality. So far, we learned from the pathology classes. So mm -hmm. yeah, that's the kind of thing to just I wanted to add. Oh, okay. Thank you so much. Yeah, I was getting a little. Just make it make it making it easier. Like let's say the blood level reflects the high creatinine level. And urine mm -hmm. osmolality can deal with the osmotic changes, like concentration kind of thing, right? Does it make sense? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay, so yeah. That's how, yeah. Thank you Thank for you. explaining. Just, just wanted to put it easier, easy term. <laughs> it's difficult Thank for me you. to also like uh, like make it think uh, easy. Like, <laughs> all right. Yeah. All right. All right. Thank okay. you. Thanks. Hopefully that tidied it up a little bit. Hopefully I didn't make it. Does that make sense? Yeah, sorry, I'm still a little confused. Okay. Let me just. Hey, Karen. Hi. Can you um, explain, I can't explain yeah. this part? I actually just okay. popped in, so I only heard like the tail end. Can you can you let can you just clear up what's confusing? So they're asking the creatinine level is, is in the urine or in the kidney, but the creatinine level is in the blood, right? Am I getting it wrong? Yeah, it's the blood marker. Come on. Uh Hello? Hi, sorry. Oh, it's not you. I'm my internet's kicking in and out. I'm actually using my phone right now. So I'll go right now so that I don't uh, kick out there again. Were, yes, it's so high. Like, it's high in the blood. Yeah. It is also going to be high in the urine, but you're not going to see that on a urine dip because your urine dip doesn't really um show creatinine. Like it it would when you send the urine down to the lab, they'd be able to see it, but that point your blood work is back anyway, so it doesn't, it's moot at that point. Um, so really where you're looking is in the blood and you're looking for the the, the creatinine and the B1. Okay. Sorry, thing? I was getting a little like. No, it's fine. Okay. Again, Kieran, and you know what? That's something that's something that it's totally reasonable to to be confused or flustered or what have you. The only reason I can answer that so quickly is because I, I literally dip urine every day in the ER, right? Like it's a constant, when you guys get into the hospital and you're doing things, these things over and over and over again, it'll be, it'll be like second nature. You won't even have to question this stuff. All of it, I promise. <laughs> I'm just going to, yeah, okay. I'm gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna kick back out, Kieran. My internet is terrible right now, so just. That's okay, we, we're, I think we're done. I'm not sure, like I'm gonna ask them if they have any other questions. Will you be posting this concept like last time? Yeah. Yeah, well, we have it already, right? I think I emailed it already. Um, yep, you yeah. emailed it. It's yeah. posted here, and I'll post it again in the student success uh, wherever. <laughs> wherever I usually post it, it'll be there as well. Um, I'm actually going to, I'm going to, you guys are done. I can turn the recording off, right? Uh, yes. Okay, I'm just going to turn that off for a quick second.